So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so excited to be able to speak to you at six o'clock on the first night. For me, it's six in the morning. Who's got jet lag? <laughs> so if I get up and have a cup of coffee halfway through, it's because it's early in the morning for me. Um, so. Who am I? I'm a coastal physical oceanographer, and I'm standing up here talking about global ocean circulation. So be gentle with me, all right? I'm replacing Bernadette Sloyan, who unfortunately couldn't make it, but she's been a great help, and she's helped me put this lecture together. Tomorrow, I'm talking about coastal ocean circulation, which is actually my passion and my forte. Um, I have two jobs. So I live in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I have a university position in Australia at the University of New South Wales, and I work for the New Zealand Met Service um, in New Zealand. So I go backwards and forwards and spend a lot of time on an aeroplane. Um, so we're working to develop New Zealand's um, operational oceanography strategy, so that's really exciting. We're a little bit behind the rest of the world. And I wanted to point out, um, for Andreas's purposes, that New Zealand doesn't feature on this logo at all. So <laughs> we're just a blip in the ocean. <laughs> Now, the, the other thing about talking first is you get to poach all the good students. So we're hiring, we've got three positions going, so if anyone's looking for a job, we're looking for an ocean data specialist, we're looking for a data assimilation modeler, and an ocean observing scientist. So come and see me anytime. I'm here until Saturday, and I've put some flyers downstairs as well. So, the real thing that I'm here to talk about. So, we're talking about global ocean observing systems. We've had a great introduction today to some of the theory and the physics, and then some of the overviews of um, um, G'day and all these global observing programs. Now we're actually going to get down to the nitty gritty. What are we observing? Um, so, we're going to be talking about Goose, the global ocean observing system, essential ocean variables, all right? So we're going to identify the essential ocean variables and the process we've gone through to actually identify them and how we measure them in the ocean, because this is what we're here for, measuring the ocean. Talk about some future developments and the new frontiers in operational oceanography. And these are my thoughts and Bernadette's thoughts, but they're no, by no means exhaustive. So Andreas gave a nice introduction to societal benefits of ocean, ocean observations, so I'm not going to linger on this slide because invariably I have 84 slides and only 45 minutes to talk about them. Um, so, early efforts in ocean observing. This one was one of the very first efforts in a large-scale ocean observing program, the Challenger Voyage of the 1870s. They set out on their boat. It took them four years. They sailed 68,000 nautical miles around the world, and it was the very first effort to systematically observe the surface of the ocean. And we'll be coming back to this one towards the end of the lecture. Since that time, there were rapid advances in technology. We were able to actually measure the ocean a little bit better. They developed things like thermometers and stuff, um, and we were able to measure temperature. Um, so we had some expeditions. These dots represent the observations that were taken in the 1930s. So that allowed for more accurate but sparse observations to be made. Andreas, I think, mentioned some of these um, expeditions earlier. Um, we had technological advances in the 30s to the 1980s, sort of sparred on by a couple of world wars and that sort of thing. A lot of development in the military um, encourages technology, which is actually a good thing, right? So new technology, and we get to benefit from that. Um, so in the 80s, the um, wise forefathers, I was still um, in primary school in the 80s, so it um, wasn't me. Um, they got together and developed some systematic global ocean observing projects, and that led to the Tau Triton Array in the Tropical Pacific area, and also the WOS program and the TOGA programs. So this was the first international effort for systematic global ocean observations. And they were really successful, and so in the early 90s, Goose was formed, the Global Ocean Observing System. Um, so this is an internationally coordinated, global scale, in situ program for observing the ocean. And of course, the societal benefit that we mentioned before. So we're really lucky that we have members of Goose here today. Um, Goose is divided into three panels. So the Ocean Physics and Climate Panel, and John Wilkin is co-chair of that panel with Bernadette Sloyan, who I'm actually replacing. Um, we have the Biogeochemical Panel and the Biological and Ecosystems Panel. So these are the, the, key, the panels. They run this way, Physics, Biogeochemistry and Biology. And these are the application areas of GOO, so climate, real-time services, so operational oceanography, and ocean health. Okay, so the, the panels and the themes are integrated and tightly coupled. Um, within the Goose framework, there are a bunch of global regional alliances. So this is a, 
a map of the world, obviously centered on Australia. I couldn't have done it better myself. Um, <laughs> and this, these uh, names here represent a bunch of the regional alliances, okay? So these um, communities have got together to coordinate regionally focused um, uh, exercises, that's not the word I'm after, but anyway, uh, projects. Projects for bilateral and multilateral activity to improve ocean observing capability. So they've got together and they've coordinated exercises in their coastal oceans, in their patch of the ocean, um, large scale ocean, and they've worked together to develop frameworks, quality control procedures, manuals, and really to, to work on um, improving the system and raising the bar for everybody to address organisational challenges and build local cap capability. So in the last few years, um, the Goose team worked really hard to develop a framework for ocean observing. So as you'll see later, a lot of these programs have sprung up from the ground up, whereas this is trying to give an overview framework um, to the observations that we are going to be collecting in the future and the ones we are collecting now. So we, Goose delivers this strategic oversight and coordination and evaluation of the program. So the idea is there's this document here, the framework for ocean observing. You can download it. I've gone and put a, lot, a bunch of web links through the talk so that you can go and click on all the documents and read them. And of course, we'll quiz you on all the acronyms later. Um, John's going to have a beer bingo or something <laughs> for any acronym that we mention. So there's um, uh, requirements have been identified, so we might need to um, understand climate change. And there's a process or an observation that we need to make. What might that be? Wow. <laughs> it's six o'clock. It's only six in the morning for me. How about temperature? You want to measure temperature? You think it's important? And then there's an output or there's data and there's products that might be developed as we measure our temperature. Okay? So it sounds like you guys need to measure, read, go and read the framework. Um, <laughs> so how do we define our essential ocean variables. So we think about the impact and the feasibility of actually measuring those observations. So we need to consider the impact, is it low or is it, is it high? And the feasibility, is that low or is it high? And ideally, you'd sit here in the sweet spot of high impact and high feasibility, so you want to be successful, all right? And that's where you target your investment. So temperature as measured by an Argo float. It's high impact, it's highly feasible, and it gives us um, what we need. So a lot of effort's been put into developing new sensors and new technology, but that's not necessarily where you should start if you're designing a global ocean program, ocean observing program. The idea is that if you want to go out and measure the ocean on a systematic, sustained way and be successful with high impact and high feasibility, you might want to go for mature things first. So um, essential ocean variables have been split up into three different um, levels of readiness, so mature, concept, and pilot, because we do actually want to be successful. And um, myself, I've been involved in an ocean observing program. We made the mistake of starting with some pilot things, and it's slow, it's hard work. So we start with mature, and not surprisingly, the ocean physics leads the biology, because we've been working on these concepts for a lot longer. Andrea said that numerical weather prediction and atmospheric sciences leads the ocean sciences, or the physics leads the biology in the ocean. So some of our essential ocean um, EOVs that are quite mature, a sea state, ocean surface stress, sea ice, sea surface height, sea surface temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, subsurface temperature. So they're real simple things to measure. So they're considered mature. Um, also down here, we've got some biogeochemical um, observations, nutrients, inorganic carbon, um, nitrous oxide, et cetera. In the concept phase are uh, sustained observations of zooplankton, biomass and diversity, coral, ocean, ocean surface heat flux. Then you come around in pilot and you've got things like tracking of marine mammals, birds, turtles, their abundance, their distribution, that kind of thing. So, if you think about the physics, we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this talk are the essential ocean variables in the physics space. So temperature, salinity and currents, surface and subsurface, sea level, sea state, sea ice. Um, ocean surface vector stress, and ocean surface heat flux, which is not yet considered mature. So we've defined our essential ocean variables, and now we need to know how we're going to measure them. So the next part of the talk, we're going to identify the observation programs that contribute to the global ocean observing system of these essential ocean variables. 
So there's six core programs. This is awesome. I love this. I've never given a lecture with this in my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just remembered I was being videoed. <laughs> okay. So there are six core programs under the, the Goose um, framework. So there's the Argo program. We're going to be talking about that. Don't worry if you don't know what Argo is. There's the Data Boy Cooperation Group. There's the Ocean Sites. Remember all these acronyms you're going to be tested on, um, which is moorings. There's the Go Ship program, the Global Ocean Ship-Based Hydrographic Investigation Program. There's the Global Sea Level um, Observations Team. Sea level observing system, GLOSS, there's the ship observations team, and that consists of the voluntary ocean ship scheme and the ships of opportunity scheme. And then, of course, there's satellite remote sensing, which is not necessarily under the GOOSE framework, but is a, a very significant component, and the GOOSE people have an opportunity to contribute um, direction and guidance to the satellite remote sensing program. And then New Frontiers, um, there's a move afoot to coordinate a group for ocean gliders. So I'm only giving one slide on satellite technology because I think there's five, six, seven lectures on different types of satellite observations over the next few days. Suffice to say that we need all these observations. They're critical, particularly in the context of operational oceanography. They're the observations that give the broad scale coverage in real time of the surface of the ocean. So the first um, GOOSE program is the Argo program, so the subsurface temperature observations. So this is an Argo float. Hands up if you're familiar with an Argo float. Anyone seen one? Anyone deployed one? Great, <laughs> there's a couple, this is good. Okay, so they get deployed in the ocean. Um, they cost about fifteen to $20,000 now. I mean, that's nothing, right? $20,000 to not have to go to sea, that's pretty good. Um, they descend down to about 1,000 metres and they drift for nine days. So you can get their drift um, at that depth. Then they descend down to 2,000 metres and then they profile to the surface. It takes about six hours. Then they sit on the surface and they transmit all their information via satellite back to land and you can get your profile in the lab. And there's a famous picture. If you Google Argo float, you'll always get that picture of some person putting float in. So where are they? Well, they're all over the globe, which is absolutely amazing. Just bear in mind that each one of these dots is about 100 kilometres wide. So we're not really covering the global ocean, <laughs> right? But it looks pretty good on a map like this. Um, so as of the 19th of September, there were 3,760 floats in the ocean. And from an Australian perspective, if you go onto our local website, you can click on your float, and you can actually get the profiles. And so these are, this is the Argo profile of um, temperature and salinity. This is this, this guy here. And then the red is the climatology. So if you get enough of these, you can start to build a climatology. And then you can see the difference, to, um, this is the difference from where that float is and what the climatology is. And this information all goes into our operational forecast. So um, the, the, the Argo is one of the main things that contributes to our understanding of upper ocean heat content. So it's really a very significant observation to be getting in real time. Other than that, you'd be kind of stuck with the satellites. And mindful that it's only the top 2,000 metres and the ocean is on average four kilometres deep. And the deepest part of the ocean is 11 kilometres. <laughs> so there's a heck of a lot of ocean that we're not observing. So shipboard observations, this is Australia's brand new ship and my team were out on that a few weeks ago, the RV Investigator. It's pretty cool, 90 metres long, um, and it's contributing to the ship-based hydrographic investigations program. So this is an international effort to cover the global ocean. We're getting high quality, high vertical and horizontal resolution observations of your standard kind of biogeochemical things. So salinity, oxygen, nutrients, carbon, etc. And the idea of the Go Ship program is you're going from the surface to the seabed, so you can go down to 4,000 metres deep, or however deep the ocean is, with some of this amazing technology. Um, this is a CTD. What does that stand for? <laughs> it's late. Everyone needs some interaction. Conductivity, temper, and depth. Thank you very much. And that's got an LAC, LADCP, a lowered ADCP sitting on that, and we're sending it out to a few thousand metres. Um, and also it measures from coast to coast, the ships, the ship program. So if you drew lines across the map, this is what you'd, you'd draw the world up like this. 
Um, obviously, there's something in the way there. They've had to go around. But um, <laughs> the idea is to grid up the ocean and do these lines repeatedly. So there are 54 core lines. These are the colours of the countries that contribute to this program. So it really is an internationally coordinated effort, and it's, it's a remarkable achievement for everyone involved. You can also see the Pacific's missing. You know, that's many, 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 many hundreds of square kilometres and not getting observed. So the next thing is moored observation. So oceanographic moorings, I forgot to put a picture in, I'm afraid. Um, they offer high temporal resolution at a point um, with rapid sampling, you know, down to minutes or half hourly or something. Um, and they have potential for high spatial uh, resolution, but low horizontal spatial resolution, unfortunately, and they're super expensive. Um, so this is an example of a mooring program that um, was deployed to measure the full transport the full depth of the East Australian current. So um, this is down to 4,000 metres, and this is 100 and something kilometres offshore, and these are lines representing um, where the moorings were, and these are all the instruments through the array. So we're getting really good coverage in the surface of the ocean there, and we're able to measure you know, the mean of the current, the variability of the current, all the way through, and this was deployed where the, the current is most coherent at 27 south off the east coast of Australia. Now, if you go to the Ocean Sites website, you can see where all the moored observations are around the world. Now, that's pretty cool, and these oceans are really deep, so trying to measure, put a mooring, a big concrete block or a steel block on the ground in 4,000 metres of water and come back a year later and pick up your observation, I mean, it, it is a remarkable achievement. I tell you, anyone can put something in the ocean, not everyone can get it back. <laughs> Remember that. Right, okay. So when you click on one of these dots, so this is the east coast of Australia, you click on the dot and all this information comes up, the agency and who um, is responsible for the information. So there's this whole network of ocean observations. Um, the different colours mean um, presently in or presently out. I'm not quite sure of the colour code. So there's also meteorological moorings, um, so over ocean estimates of um, surface temperature and fluxes are really, really important for, for our atmospheric forecasts as well as our ocean forecasts. Um, unfortunately, countries like Australia, massive countries, massive ocean, don't have many meteorological um, observations. Look at the United States. I mean, look at something like 300 buoys in the United States buoy program. Um, and some countries don't have any, so how are you going to get an observation that's going to inform your weather forecast from the day before if the, all the ocean's coming across, all the wind is coming across the ocean? So um, we do need some work in this space, I, in my opinion. So the next one is the surface drifter program. So this is what our surface drifters look like. They've droged at about 15 metres depth. I'm sorry it's so Australian focused, it's what I know. Um, as I said, my team were out on a ship a few weeks ago, and the, this is the East Australian current coming down the coast, four knots of current, seven degree temperature gradient across the front. And this is a cyclonic eddy stuck in there and an anti-cyclonic eddy stuck in there. And for an operational oceanography perspective, we're interested in the transport of larvae of lobster in the region. And what our models have showed, I'm digressing here, but what our models have showed is that um, larval transport goes onshore through these eddy dipoles. And we actually wanted to go out and study this eddy dipole and see what happened. So you can just see here the ship track through there. And we deploy drifters, that's these pink arrows. We deploy drifters in the eddy dipole. And this is about a week later, and you can see the drifters have gone on the merry-go-round. So they're going round the warm core eddy, and they've gone round the cold core eddy, and it's getting a bit squeezed in there. And then this was just yesterday, I had a look, and they've all joined up together, and they're all going round and round the cold core eddy. So that's really very cool. Um, and that's me putting in a drifter. So these it, observations all contribute to the Global Drifter Array program. And I got this off the website on the 25th of September, and that massive blob there are all the drifters that we deployed. So that's really cool as well. So you can go online and you can see all your information. But what do you do with all this information? Well, you get spaghetti plots showing the surface currents of the ocean. And if you put it all together, you can actually get current speeds. So it's a really cost-effective way of looking at Lagrangian pathways in the ocean. And if you're interested in Lagrangian things like the transport of plastics or the transport of larvae, it's a really effective mechanism. Then there's the Volunteer Observing Ships Program. So these ships are not research vessels. They're commercial vessels that volunteer to collect oceanographic observations potentially because it's really important for safety at sea. They think it's a good thing. This is great. Maybe it's just because they're bored on those long transects and they want something to do. Um, 
either is a possibility. So they, they, there's a really cool video here. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, so click on that when you're doing your homework. Um, it talks about um, the people down on the dock, that they rely on these observations for safety at sea. They need to know um, what the atmospheric conditions are, and then they relay it on um, to the ship that's coming behind them, etc. So some of the things that they measure is um, subsurface temperature using an XPT, an expendable bathythermiograph. And that profiles temperature to about 800 metres. And I'm, it's disappointing that that's me. I'm not holding the XPT, I don't know why, but the creepy guy behind me <laughs> is holding the XPT. But anyway, I went to the Antarctic on the Astrolab, and one day I was sunny enough to go out and take a photo, and I wasn't actually the one doing it. But here's the, the launcher here, and you've got a copper wire, and it goes down to about 800 metres, and it measures um, the temperature in the ocean, and we know the fall rate, and so we get this pro beautiful profile. So there's an XPT program, and these are all the routes that are run regularly. Um, some of these lines have been going for 20, 30 years, and they're remarkable data set of the history of the surface temperature well, up 800 metres of the ocean. So there's a bunch of high-density routes. 49 of them are occupied four times per year, and they do one profile every 25 kilometres. So the route I did was this one here from Antarctica down to the Antarctic. Sorry, from Tasmania down to the Antarctic. I had to get up every hour, every hour across the convergence and do my XBT lines. I've never been so exhausted in my life. It took 20 minutes, run up to the bridge, turn on the computer, run down, run out to the back deck, throw the XBT, fall asleep on the... <laughs> waiting for 10 minutes, come back, run upstairs, turn it off, go to bed for 40 minutes and do it all over again. Um, it was an amazing experience. If you get the opportunity, these li they're always looking for people to do these lines, so volunteer, it's fantastic. Um, and there's a bunch of different routes. The data provide about 15% of the upper ocean temperature observations globally. One of the other programs is the underway sampling, thermosalinograph sampling, um, measuring sea surface temperature and salinity at the sea surface. So a lot of ships now, you know, your standard bulk carrier or whatever, installs the instrument through an intake pipe at some, the water comes in at some depth below the, the sea level, the top seven or 10 metres, and the information is relayed via satellite. So again, these in, this information is critical for understanding changes in the, um, in the temperature and the salinity, which goes into the operational programs. Um, tide gauges, again, this is, um, tide gauge from a 100-year-old tide gauge, and it's still in operation in Sydney Harbour, which is really kind of cool. I was so excited to go and see it. Um, I really am an ocean nerd. Um, anyway, this is a modern tide gauge. This is an example from Hurricane um, Irma a few weeks back. There have been so, so many hurricanes. This is the observations of the sea level, and this is what was actually observed. That's one and a half metre depression in sea level. Um, prior to the hurricane, and then um, as the current hurricane hit, there was a big storm surge. So these information are important operationally in real time to show what's going on right here and now, but then they're also useful for um, global records of sea level rise, okay? So um, the international program, and again, you can go and go to this website, um, the international program records all these observations and keeps very accurate measurements, um, which are used to understand um, long-term changes in sea level. So there are about 300 sea level tide gauge stations um, internationally. And again, all the data go through to a global archive. I would point out that each one of these archives is potentially different, um, which is potentially a challenge. But in real time, the data delivery goes through to the GTS, the Global Telecommunication, Telecommunication System. And this is the backbone system for exchange of data and information internationally. And so it supports all these operational um, needs, basically. So your weather information and all the sea information, and then you can grab all that data off the GTS. If you want to set up your own operational forecast, start at the GTS um, for accessing the data. So this is essential for operational oceanography. So in delayed mode, Goose have been really involved in coordinating activities across the world. So delayed mode means you know, data that might be six months old or 12 months old. So you can actually go and QC your data properly. So quality control it, take out the spikes and that kind of thing. If you're operating in real time and you want to assimilate into your model, you've got to do some really quick automated quality control. But the Argo program, for example, every single Argo profile is looked at by a human. Um, to make sure that the observations are absolutely the best quality they could possibly be, because they're using these observations to, to measure upper ocean heat content and to say that the ocean is warming. So you want to be sure that you've got it right. 
So that's the delayed mode data management. And then secure archiving. You've spent a lot of time and effort collecting all this data. You want to know that it's archived properly and securely and that you're not going to lose it or accidentally press delete. Um, <laughs> so that was a real whirlwind view of some of the essential ocean variables and some of the tools and programs that we use to actually um, collect information on our essential ocean variables. And each one is unique. It has its own strengths and weaknesses. But if you put it all together, you get the spatial and temporal sampling that's required you know, by integrating across multiple platforms. So satellite gives you sea surface coverage. Your Argo gives you one point location. Um, your moorings give you high resolution in time, but not in space, and so on and so forth. But when you bring it all together, you get a really comprehensive, integrated network. And the world looks a lot more dense, right? Or the observing network looks a lot more dense. So this is all the observations put together. Again, each dot is probably 100 kilometers wide, but we're starting to get some good coverage. And that's pretty good for a program that kind of each one kind of grew up um, on its own. So now if we look at this network, we want to think, well, how effective is it? How are we going to sustain it? Do we need all these observations? Do we need all the blue observations and none of the red observations? So we now have to start to think, we need to evaluate the observation. We need to evaluate the observing system. I believe there's a whole lecture on that, so I'm only going to touch on it briefly. The things you might want to consider is you need to constantly monitor and evaluate the observing system to ensure that you're getting the outcomes that you want. So for example, this is the Tau Triton Array, which is across the tro tropical Pacific. And this is time from 2004 to 2014. And these are the number of um, buoys that were recording and returning data. And you see that in 2012 and 13, there was a real drop in observations coming in. And that was through decay and a bit of neglect and probably a lot of funding cuts. And before we knew it, you know, we were in trouble. We weren't actually getting the number of observations that we thought we were required. So we need to actually think about our programs and go back and reflect and work out, do we need all those observations? So that's temporal evaluation. We also want to look at spatial eva evaluation. Argo did this from the very beginning. They said, we're going to divide the world into three by three degree grid. We want 3,000 Argo floats. We're going to deploy X number a year. And in by the year 2006, maybe, was it? we're going to have 3,000 floats in the ocean. When they got there a year early, you know, the whole world agreed on this program and off they went. Um, so this is our voluntary ships of opportunity, um, their spatial coverage, and this is the density sampling of Argo floats. So you can see the red is really low density still, so there's gaps in the program. So now they send ships, or they try to get floats on ships that are going to those regions so that we can observe there. We also want to evaluate um, by depth. So these are our global temperature observations per month. So this was the start of the, Glide, the Argo program. So significant impact, taking the temperature observations down to 2,000 metres. Um, this is salinity records. So blue is up 1,000 metres, again, the impact of Argo. And red is below 1,000 metres. Um, so we're not doing very well um, below 1,000 metres. There's still a lot of ocean that we're not observing. So when you put all that together, you've got your space, your time, your depth, etc. You also want to think about the future. So if you think about retirement of assets, loss of assets, um, where are the gaps going to be in the future based on the lifetime of equipment you already have and planned future deployments and um, start to think about likely gaps. And as I said, these Arctic and Antarctic regions are the hardest to actually observe and maintain equipment in. I don't know why there's that blob there, but I'll go on a cruise there. That would be fun. So when you put it all together and actually think strategically about designing an observing system, you will come up with TPOS 2020. So TPOS 2020 is the Tropical Pacific Observing System, and it's a plan for 2020. So they're taking all the historical information into account, and they come out with a plan to observe the Tropical Pacific using all the assets that we described to get the best spatial coverage and the best temporal coverage that is required. We're not saying we need to observe every patch of the ocean, we need to understand which patch of the ocean we do need to observe and how impactful those observations are. And that's where those observation impact studies that Andreas touched on briefly today are so important. So it's a framework for coordinated ocean observing. And who knows, 2023 is time. Maybe you guys will all be involved. I mean, that would be terrific. You come away from the summer school and go, I want to be in TPOS. Um, maybe I'll get involved. <laughs> It'd be great. 
So then we bring it all together. We've got this framework put together by Goose for ocean observing. We think about the issues and the requirements, what to measure, what the essential ocean variables are. Then you've got all these different platforms that contribute to your observations and your deployment. And then you get your data products and think about the impact on your issues. Have we solved the problem? Do we need to keep observing those things? And go back and start again. So it's a critical feedback loop. So you're assessing continually, are the observations necessary? Are we investing in the right place, in the right time, in the right asset? And it's science driven based on the requirements. <coughs> so, how long have I got? I didn't see what time we started. 15 minutes? Awesome. 20? Um, so, new frontiers. So, while autonomous gliders are not new technology, really, they've been around for a good 10, 15 years or so, they are in the context of a sustained global ocean observing program. So gliders are really cool because they give a spatial and temporal resolution, and they also connect from the deep ocean to the coast or the coast to the deep ocean. And that's that region that's often not observed. Gliders, uh, sorry, Argo floats, really don't sample the coastal, coastal ocean, for example, or very well. Um, so this is a glider. Anyone seen a glider? Anyone deployed a glider? Anyone use glider data? That's cool. So this is a deep water glider. Came out of um, Washington. Shouldn't pretend to know. Um, what was it? APL? Yeah. Um, they're not pink anymore, they're now yellow. Um, yum yum yellow. Mythbusters did a thing on sharks and they said that sharks are attracted to yellow. Just remember that. Um, so the gliders go down through the water column, down to about 1,000 metres. They come up and they transmit their information. The timing of that descent um, depends on, or how long it takes to descend, depends on how deep the water is. Meanwhile, they're measuring um, temperature, salinity. So they've got a seabird CTD or a CTD on them, conductivity, temperature, depth. They have optical sensors measuring fluorescence, dissolved organic matter, backscatter, and they have an oxygen optode. Um, the sensors, you can add other things, um, animal tagging and tracking tags, for example. You can also use the um, depth average velocity or obtain the depth average velocity from the glider drift during a particular dive. They're only about one and a half to two metres long and they weigh 50 kilos, so literally you can just chuck them over the side of a boat. We deploy ours in 25 metres of water and send them out for a few weeks because they're coastal. These guys can travel um, 4,500 kilometres and last um, many, many months, three or four months or even longer if if um, you turn off some of the sensors. So I got this off the web today. These are examples of endurance lines off the west coast of the United States. So an endurance line is a line that goes out and comes back and just does the same thing over and over and over. And you can do that in relatively benign environments like an eastern boundary current. But if you look here in the Florida um, region in a western boundary current, you can't do endurance lines, okay? So these gliders have been caught up in eddies, but you can measure the hydrodynamics of an eddy, and that's really exciting as well. So different applications for different environments, and I suspect these observations are more important because if you get the eddies in the right spot, you get transport right in a dynamic western boundary current. So an international glider network is a new frontier in operational oceanography, and there's a move afoot. Um, and some of the people in this room, I believe, were involved in this paper that came out recently to present a, a glider program as part of Goose, and that's going to be really exciting. These are all the glider missions that have occurred globally um, in the last 10 years or so, and these are all ours from my observing program on the east coast of Australia, so that's kind of cool. So another new frontier is trans-ocean basin gliders. I mentioned the Challenger mission right at the start of the talk where they got in their boat and sailed around the world for four years. Well, um, John's colleagues at Rutgers decided they want to recreate it in a glider. Has anyone heard of the glider Challenger mission? That's what, Cliff, you're from Rutgers, you've heard of it surely. <laughs> um, so anyway, they said they're going to send a glider around the world. And just yesterday, the Australian team, together with um, the Rutgers team, retrieved a glider in Sri Lanka. So they let it go in Perth, and about four or five months later, it ended up in Sri Lanka. And this is you know, the Sri Lankan High Commissioner and all that sort of stuff. And um, it was really kind of cool. It's got the R for Rutgers on it. And this is one of the Australian guys there, Cherry Pederacci, who leads the Australian glider program. So that's um, its mission all the way to Sri Lanka. They had to turn the payload off, the instruments off, halfway through the mission so as not to lose battery. But it's pretty remarkable that the first half of the mission, they were diving to 1,000 metres and collecting really cool information. And my team deployed a glider last week, and so it's in the water right there. 
So another new frontier which is not yet in the um, Goose framework, but might be and should be, is biologging. So this is the requisite elephant seal with a CTD on its head. Anyone heard of that? We love seals as samplers because they go where oceanographers don't go. Um, they can dive to great depth, 1,800 metres. They go under the ice. They have foraging regions that they go back to repeatedly. Um, in coastal waters, we've got seals that are tagged, we've got penguins that are tagged, and they're going out and they're profiling up and down and they're collecting vast, vast data sets. So this was the um, temperature data at 200 metres that was in the um, Global Temperature Archive prior to using seals as samplers. This was the contribution of the seals themselves. Look at the distances these guys have travelled, how much information has been collected over the last 15 years by seals. And this is the resolution of the Antarctic fronts, or the fronts around the Antarctic, using the data without the seals. And this is with, with the seal data. They've filled in so many data gaps. It's like saying, hey guys, go over there and fish. I mean, it's just remarkable. They're collecting so much information, and eventually these little tags, they just fall off. And they're not even that expensive. And it's all coming back in real time. So I suspect that eventually, if this data goes up into the GTS, it's going to be assimilated into ocean models everywhere. A really, really, really valuable data set. So other new frontiers. Um, I think someone's going to be talking later about Argo in more detail. There's deep Argo, so going down really deep because we acknowledge that there's a real gap in subsurface observations, and bio Argo, so bringing the biology in um, routine observations. Autonomous sur surface vehicles such as wave gliders or sail drones um, to get surface flux observations, wave observations. There's concepts of swarms and adaptive sampling. You send out a swarm of gliders, and when it hits something, it, it, the program adapts, so you might be wanting to survey a front and when you get a temperature gradient of three degrees, keep going across that. So you're measuring your front um, repeatedly based on what they're adapting the program based on what you're actually observing. In situ biogeochemical water sensors, like mini CTDs that collect water samples, maybe you could put one of them on a seal's head. So a little water rosette um, collecting information as it goes up and down. And this is my passion here. Um, the coastal ocean, okay? So high density, high resolution observations. So clearly we know that the majority of societal benefit is in the coastal ocean. Countries like Australia, 80% of the population live by the coast and heavily impacted by the coast. And this is where we get all our food source. The majority of the productivity occurs in the coastal ocean, obviously shipping, etc. So this is really one of the new frontiers in um, coastal ocean observing and getting all that information in real time into our operational systems and developing forecasts. So there'll be more about that tomorrow. So, we made it. In summary, <laughs> um, Goose provides international coordination of the national and international observing programs. Um, they've worked very hard over the last decade to define essential ocean variables based on their readiness level. Um, they provide a systematic approach to designing observing systems and also to secure those observations and to share them with everyone. So that's really important as well. There's no point keeping them just for ourselves. And all these observations underpin operational oceanography and data assimilation. You can't have an operational forecast, a good one, without any data. And then these really good forecasts save lives, grow the blue economy. It allows stakeholders to realise the benefit of their in situ observations. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who has a question? Yeah. I'm not sure I know the answer, but we can try. That's fine. I was wondering if you are familiar with the SEAL data? And if so, if you see a bias in the, um, in the sampling based on like their foraging patterns or anything like that? Do you mean like a warm bias or a preferred location to eat? Uh, either, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, like I would think they would go, yeah, somewhere warm to, to forage or, you know, for food or something. Um, th the different animals definitely have their preferred things to do. So I know off the southern coast of Australia, there's two types of SEALs and I'm not intimately familiar, but one of the seals swims out across the surface until it gets the 200 meter isobath and then it goes up and down at the 200 meter isobath. The other one, Toyo, is up and down all the way across. So two completely different animals, I mean both seals, 
have totally different foraging behaviours. And that's why the biologists are so excited about this data, because you're getting real-time information on the temperature, the salinity, the location, to understand the foraging behaviour. So it's really opening up information about marine food webs and all that kind of thing. So we've got a program um, studying penguins, working with the biologists who are tracking these things to find out why they forage where they do. A lot of them do have preferences, but either way, you're still getting way more data than you had before. Very cool. Thanks.